Okay, there we go. So I apologize for that technology. Uh, so let's get going. So there's lots of different equipment we can use. Uh, I'll go through it. Uh, there's a lot of gadgets you can buy nowadays. Uh, I'm not against any gadgets, but uh, it's, I'd say I'd recommend people learn the basics first with standard equipment. Uh, and then eventually, so worry uh, and all those other types of hives, they're, they're good. Uh, but I'd say in winter, it's important if, especially if you have a winter to be able to look inside no, your collar. Okay. Oh. Oh, exactly. I'll just ask you to mute yourself. Okay. So it's important that you get practice with uh, the basics before you, you, you get too complicated. Okay, so beginner sequence. Uh, so getting bees, I'd say I talked a bit about this last time, but uh, you can either buy uh, nucleus hives, so nooks or packages. Uh, up here in the Yukon and a lot of places in Canada, we, we tend to, to stick with nooks. We do get packages. Uh, I know there's one person on the call here who's starting with a top bar hive. So I'll have a chat later, but I'd recommend you probably go with a package because uh, installing a nook in a top bar hive has its challenges. Uh, race bees. Uh, I'd say for cold climates, stay away from Italians. I'd say carnies, so carniolans, uh, types, saskatraz, and hybrids, and new carlo carniolans, uh, buckfest, and the black bees, the German black bees, or English black bees are all pretty good. But I'd say carnies is the most common one, and it's probably the best one to, uh, to, to use in northern climates. Uh, protective equipment, so bee suit, gloves. Uh, I typically just wear a veil because I don't like getting stung in the face. Uh, and then I just wear a, a light colored shirt, long sleeve shirt, uh, so that the bees don't get, they don't really, they're more attracted to dark. So I find light colored clothing is better. Uh, I, I have some pictures there, so if this is your first season, uh, I'd say for your brood nests, probably a medium, like a double medium is probably not big enough and there's too much separation in the nest. So I'd recommend you go with at least, That's at wrong. least or two. That's wrong. Okay, just a sec there, I'm gonna mute somebody. What's wrong? Okay, so I muted everybody. Sorry about that. So back to the slideshow. So, Frame depth, so a deep is nine and five eighths depth. So basically that's pretty much standard for a brood nest. So in the next talk, we'll talk about biology. So biology is important because then it puts these this equipment in perspective. I typically cover biology before I do equipment so people can relate to why I choose uh, the type of equipment that I choose because it's really it's based on biology uh, a few people were asking for this talk first so that's uh, why I'm doing it in this order so a deep frame uh, is quite heavy so a super so a, a box full of frames full of honey uh, it'll be over 100 pounds so uh, it's a backbreaker so that's why I typically do my honey in mediums, and then I do my brood nests in deeps, uh, just so that there's uh, 
one frame might have 10 to 20 pounds of honey in it. So when you're overwintering, it's important to have a lot of good heavy stores. Uh, number of frames in a box. Uh, I've overwintered five frames, uh, six frames, eight frames, nine frames, 10 frames. So uh, it's really not the number of frames that's important. It's, uh, it's the thermal stability of your boxes. So insulation uh, in Northern climates and it's, uh, it's the number of bees. So we'll talk about that, but the more bees you have per volume, uh, the better. Foundation type, you can use none. Uh, up here, season's so short. So if you go none, it takes forever to draw out that wax. Uh, hence the reason you need to use uh, a lot of sugar syrup. And if you don't want to feed your bees, then I'd say beekeeping in the north is not for you. So uh, it's just one of those things we need to do is we need to feed our bees a few times a year. And if you don't, then you won't be able to be successful. That's just the way it is. Uh, BR location, we'll talk about that in this talk. And we'll talk about why certain criteria is important. And like we talked about last time, so I'd say two hives, uh, at least two hives is important because it gives you a comparative, uh, but it also gives you resources. So if you only have one colony and it's struggling, you've got nothing to help that colony out. But if you have two, you can take resources from one colony and share it with the other one. Uh, so getting your bees, we talked about that, but uh, for folks in the Yukon, uh, we tend to fly them up because uh, delivery by, by truck or land is way too slow. Uh, and there's too many things that can happen. We've had on occasion, somebody drive up bees here uh, from Northern BC, but uh, that's not always the case. Uh, but flying bees from Vancouver, I've had bees from Ottawa flown in that uh, did okay. And then I think we've had pre COVID days there when we had uh, direct flight to Edmonton, it was another way of getting bees. Uh, I have gotten Queens Canada Post. So there's the box, there's a queen cage. Uh, and the queen did really, really well. So, and then I guess we'll talk about uh, equipment types and hive types in a bit. And then uh, we'll talk about which fits better. So, Anybody get sting yet this year? Yes. Oh, good. Twice. <laughs> Twice, anybody else? Yeah, Arby here, quite a few times. Good. Uh, were, were, were you at fault or were the bees uh, quite excited to see you? Uh, no, mostly just... Um... How do I describe it? Getting a little aggressive. Yeah. Do you go gloveless? Than the bees. Do you beekeep gloveless or with uh, gloves? At the time, I was gloveless. Okay. Sounds I good. I went commando. Repeat I had that. no bee suit on, no gloves on, and uh, they poked over their heads over the top, and then I did something that I shouldn't have done, and I got what I deserved. So. Next time I go back in, it'll be a different story. Sounds good. I, uh, I bought my first EpiPen uh, two days ago. I'm not allergic, but just to have it in case. So I'd say for, like I said, our faces swell up quite badly. So I recommend you wear a veil. And then the bee suit is optional. I like wearing long sleeves. And for spring cleanup and stuff like that, I'll wear my gloves but I've started going gloveless and just using, I'll start using those nitrile gloves that, so I have more dexterity. Uh, tool wise, again, have a smoker. You don't really need to use it, uh, but it's handy to have one lit. 
because uh, I tend to kill fewer bees if I have a smoker and I smoke the bees before putting the boxes back together. So less bees get squished. I used to use burlap, uh, but la last year I started using moose uh, pellets. And I went out at uh, the golf course here, any lake golf course and drove around the quad and then filled up a big five gallon pail full of moose turds and dried them in the sun. And it actually works really well uh, and it's free. Uh, hive tool, so I've got both, but I like the J hook now. So for those uh, in the White Horse area, we'll probably do a B day. So where we can actually just go out in the field and practice stuff. But uh, this is the one I use now, uh, just because it's it works better for me. This one's more of a pry bar, uh, but with my poly hives, and me not wanting to damage the, the, the polystyrene, I find this one is better to use. Uh, I used to use water spray, so sugar water spray. Uh, now I use it more to spray my frames, my bare frames and foundations to, to give the, the bees uh, some, uh, I guess, some incentive to start drawing that wax out. Uh, Sometimes I'll spray the bees just to, to knock them down a bit, but I find smoke just works better. I keep a, a lit smoker beside and just the, uh, the, the whiff of smoke helps uh, keep them calm. Uh, bee brushes, I do have one. I'd say I don't recommend this one. The horse hair, it really pisses the bees off. Just the, the straight plastic one or a paintbrush, I find works well. Uh, bee escapes. Uh, I used to use them, but now I just shake the bees out and use a brush to brush the bees off. I don't have enough honey supers. I have, I don't know, I, I cultivate probably uh, five to six honey supers and that's plenty. And I can just shake the bees off fairly quick to, uh, to get them free. Uh, it's, it's important to have a couple of, once you start requeening your hives, you'll have some old queen cages, especially the plastic ones. Uh, I keep them because they're handy because sometimes I see the queen and I don't want her to get squished in what I'm doing. So I'll just cage her and put her on the side. Uh, challenge now is the weather's still pretty damn cold up here. So it's better to just keep the queen and your inspections to a minimum. And uh, for tools, the other one I don't have on here is a uh, like a plumber's torch. So I've started this season to actually disinfect my tools. Uh, and I also use it to scorch my old frames, any woodware, uh, not my polys because it'll melt on there. But uh, so if there's any mold or bee poop on it, I use the torch to, to just uh, singe that and disinfect it uh, and then scrape it off. But uh, those torches are handy and it really works well to light your smoker. You just use the, my dad bought me one of those automatic ones where you just turn the propane on and there's a button, a trigger, and it lights automatic. Uh, to light my smoker now is super easy. So let's see, we'll start with typical wood. So you've got a top cover. Uh, even in the summer, I because I use polys, it's insulated year round, but uh, my wood hive set that I do use occasionally, it, basically the top is always insulated. Uh, it actually helps keep transmitting the sun in. So in a hot summer day, uh, the, that surface contact is a 40, 50 degrees Celsius. So it's a hundred plus 110 degrees uh, Fahrenheit sometimes. So that's way hotter than what the nest is. So then the bees have to keep it cool. So by having an inch or two inch styrofoam embedded in your top covers, if you use wooden wear, uh, you're just protecting your nest from overheating. And it just helps those bees thermoregulate even better. Uh, so this top box here is just medium, so you can see how it's, it's six inches and some, three eighths, I think. So that's a medium, so a honey super it's called. 
and the boxes down here in this configuration, uh, these are deeps, our standard boxes. So we call these, this is where the, the, the colony keeps its nest and we call them uh, the brood nest. So if, just to get the terminology right. So this one is a double brood nest. Uh, and then it's got a shim here. And I think it's, uh, it was just a, a feeder shim and they were feeding up here. And this here was just a double, a double. And you can see that this is a screened bottom board. So this bottom board here a lot of times has a solid bottom, but this one has a grid, a screen. And so they put a debris board to capture the debris that falls down. And over here is just one of those standard polys. Uh, they're good. The only thing I don't like about these ones, uh, I have mostly this. So this is my feeder here. <clears throat> the problem is I can't put pollen patties between the frames and the feeder. There's not enough space. There's literally no space. So I've had to use a modified inner cover from a wooden kit that I've insulated to give me enough space to put a pollen patty. And then I've, where the entrance is to this feeder, I've uh, drilled out and cut out the, uh, the portals. And you'll notice most of my hives in my location, so this is Whitehorse, this is uh, Annie Lake Road. Uh, we're much colder at night than in the morning than in town. Uh, so I, protect my hives year round. So you can see how I put a piece of a two by four here to, to prevent any wind or airflow to go directly below the brood nest. Okay, so these this is a screen bottom board. It has an insert in there, but I don't want cold air to get underneath here. So everything is protected. I'm a mechanical engineer and I know how much energy is wasted trying to heat structures and buildings. So uh, I know how the bees feel. Question. Sure. Where the, um, the top feeder is and the deep is, what if you put in an emery shim that has the cutout for the bees to be able to access the sugar water up through that point? That's one question. So I'll start with that. Question. Okay, go go ahead, Bernie. Okay, and the second question is, are is this what you call classic bearding? And if you had a bottom, um, a slatted bottom board at the bottom of the deep, would that not stop them from doing that and allow them to cool the hive from the bottom side while they're inside? So the first one about your shim, uh, the challenge with, it's called bee space. So if your shim uh, just allows about three eighths of an inch. So a lot of these pollen patties are a half inch thick. So you got to squish it. So I usually squish it between two to two by fours and make it as thin as possible. So I could have a thinner shim. Uh, I like buying, like I build my own things, but sometimes I just don't have the time. So I'll just buy things off the shelf. And I bought some inner covers uh, from, uh, I guess a supplier down South. He sent me six of them and it had about a three quarter inch gap. So last year I didn't fill that gap with anything. So then there was burr comb all over the tops and I was, Pretty much every week during every inspection, I had to clean the tops of those frames to keep them clean. And I guess this year, what I did was I added, uh, I embedded uh, some bubble foil in there to, to eat up about, uh, I don't know, a quarter inch or a bit more, two, three eighths of an inch. So it left about three eighths of an inch gap there. And then the pollen patty could just squeeze into the bubble foil wrap. Uh, so the key is if you use shims, if you leave too much space, the bees are gonna fill that space with wax and comb. And then you just have to clean it or just live with it. And on the slatted rack in the bottom, so I didn't talk about slatted racks, but basically it's 
a false bottom uh, and it will help. So I'm pretty sure this picture here was after I consolidated this box. So this was just after my spring inspection. This had been a double and basically the bottom box, this is the top box that was on top of a bottom. Uh, was pretty much empty and I consolidated the bees all into one box to get them to reduce the volume and increase the number of bees per volume to give them a better boost so they could build a bigger brood nest. Uh, hence the reason the bees are out like that is it was more from my inspection and my consolidating. But yes, if you had a, uh, a slatted rack, they could... Uh, they have, they will really beard out here. It's not warm enough. Thank you. No worries. Uh, so just some, some uh, nomenclature, some words. So outer cover, inner cover. So inner cover helps you, it prevents heat from going through uh, because there's just a little hole in the middle here. So you take your top cover off, then there's just a three inch hole, diameter hole typically in this cover. So it's a way of opening up without exposing the whole colony. On polystyrene, uh, I often put a piece of uh, vapor barrier, so six mil, and it's just cut out to the, the size of this box. And what that does is I can take my top cover off, my feeder, there might be a little bit of slot here, but uh, the bees won't come all flying and it keeps the heat inside the boxes. Uh, honey supers, so these are shallows. Uh, I've never used shallows, I've used mediums. So here's a medium, here's a deep. Uh, so shallows, we are seasons too short up here to bother with shallows. Uh, and our nectar flows are usually not big enough to do deeps. So I find a medium is that perfect size. And the more frames you have, the smaller, it just means more work when you're extracting. So that's why I find the medium just the perfect size. Uh, queen excluder, exactly what it says. It's to exclude the queen. So it prevents the queen from going up into the honey supers. I haven't used one. I think I used one last year for a couple of weeks, but I haven't used the Queen Excluder uh, much in the last eight, nine years. Uh, I do accept that I may get the occasional small brood nests in the frames here, but it's part of my strategy to, to get frames drawn out is a bit of brood up in the, the honey super. We'll get that wax drawn out a lot quicker than if there's no brood up there. Uh, typically I'll do that first, get the bees to come up and the queen, she'll lay a small nest in the middle. Then I'll put the queen in So then there's brood to pull the, the bees up and then they'll manage that. And then they'll tend to draw out that box quite well. So a deep super and then a bottom board. So you can see this is a solid bottom board and then it's got an entrance reducer over there. Uh, and then a stand is optional. I just use pieces of plywood and two by fours and that's, that's what my stand is. So you can buy these things or you can make your own, but they're really not required. They just look question. good. I have a question, Etienne. Go ahead, Bernie. It's to do with the poly supers where you're allowing your queen, your, you said you do away with your queen excluder. Now in the cool of the evening, does the queen go back down into the deep or do you have to look for your queen when you're going through your, your, uh, your medium boxes? So when, before I put the queen excluder, I have to make sure the queen is not in the medium. So I'll chase her down, I'll move her down. Thank you. Yeah. And if, if there's a broodness up there, she'll just stay warm until she has a retune of 
of other bees that'll keep her warm. So wherever she goes, she'll be surrounded by bees. But you got to make sure the queen's not up there when you put the excluder. And you can see this, this bottom board here, this is a mesh. I forget what size, maybe quarter inch, just below the size that a bee could fit through. And all the debris from the top boxes fall through here and then there's an insert. And you can see how there's these legs and there's a gap there. So that's the gap that I cover with my two by fours to prevent any airflow going below the, the colony. Uh, entrance reducers. This one down south, it's, it seems to be a bigger deal. I tend to have my, my small size on for the first, probably till uh, the colony is really strong and into May, mid-May, early June, I'll have my small size. And then I have, I made my own with two screws. So to make it easier to, to put in and pull out, I just have two screws protruding out. And typically I have a two inch, let's see, two inch, yeah, about two inch uh, entrance to three inch max. And most of my reducers have one size. They have closed and two inch. And uh, it doesn't really affect my honey harvest or the, I guess the colonies overheating. So the thing with a poly, polystyrene hive is they won't really overheat uh, because it's like a house. If you live down south or in a warm climate and your house isn't insulated, your house will be really, really warm because it heats up in the sun uh, and then it cools down at night. Uh, but if you have a well-insulated house in that warm climate, it maintains its temperature a lot easier with a lot less energy. I lived in Australia and the house where I lived was all made of bricks and it had insulation. So it was hot during the day and then it would cool down at night. So any questions there? Fairly straightforward. Uh, tools, budget-wise, this one depends who, it, if you get it used or new. But typically up here, to get one colony, it'll cost you with the bees and the suits and all that, I'd say 600 to 1000 bucks uh, for a first season. That's just one colony. And then after that, uh, so yeah, it's almost... 400 to 600 dollars per per colony uh, if you don't have any equipment okay so the safety gear a couple hundred bucks but after that uh, it's the bees that are expensive my previous price was 200 to 275 but now looking at the prices it's 300 to 375 uh, with shipping uh, bags of sugar, the first year hive, I'd say typically two bags. A bag is 10 kg or is it 22 pounds. Yeah, I Don't scare them. Oh. I think it's not scary. Can you? Yeah. Do you guys mind uh, muting yourself, please? No, oh, can you? What? Thank you. So yeah, I'd say two bags. So 20 to 40 pounds of sugar in a first year hive would be fairly normal. And, uh, and uh, yeah, up here, a, a 10 kg bag, 22 pound bag is about 12 bucks. Uh, most of us live in bear country. Uh, so you've just spent a couple thousand dollars to get a couple of hives going. Uh, don't lose it to a bear. So just get a, an electric fence, get it over with if there's bears in your area, because it's just uh, not worth losing uh, a colony to that. We'll talk about time commitment in a bit, but basically initial setup, painting, assembly is about a, a weekend's worth of work to get things organized. If you have friends or kids, they can help you out. And then usually second year I spend maybe 10 to 15 minutes a uh, hive per 10 days 
if you're a beginner, it might be 30 minutes to an hour per hive as you get used to things. But uh, you can say it's about that. So I just did my spring inspections and cleanup last this weekend and a single colony, brood colony takes me about 10 minutes, five to 10 minutes to, to do my full inspection and cleanup. And a double took me about uh, 15 to 20 minutes, depending on how much stuff I had to do. And that includes putting the pollen patties, reducing in size, reorienting frames and, and pretty much uh, closing it back up. So again, prices are variable, but uh, I found that wood, wooden wear and poly wear are pretty much the same price now. Uh, a lot of beginners wait to the last minute to assemble their kits and then they rush. So I've had a friend who's had to supply a new beekeeper with a lot of stuff because they had nothing ready to, to start their season. What? Uh, in uh, cold climates, yeah, I want you guys to start getting in In cold climates, we've got, uh, for example, this, this morning it was minus 14 Celsius here at my place, and it got up to maybe four degrees. So if you're wanting to paint your kit in that weather, uh, the paint's never going to cure. So either paint your stuff in the summer if you can, or if you have a shed or a heated garage, you'll have to do it indoors. So we'll talk about yard and then we'll move on to a couple of other things. Uh, let's see, full sun I find works the best, uh, especially poly hives and especially up here, it never really gets warm enough for your colonies to overheat and it helps get the bees active quicker in the morning. So like I mentioned before, my pallet fence here protects it against the wind. But what I've done now is I have black geotex on these uh, pallets. And what it does is it attracts the heat, which heats up the bee yard a lot quicker. Uh, and then it also melts the snow much quicker. So my, the, the snow around my bee yards is melted way before, uh, I guess, the snow in the field. Uh, you might think this is a small yard, but most places in the Yukon can't sustain more than two to four hives. There's just not enough forage. So here, for example, this is probably, there's probably 80 acres of fields. And the one back here is all fireweed. Uh, and there's just enough for two hives. Okay, the yeah. mountainside here has a bunch of uh, high bush cranberries and all these native flowers up here. But uh, it just doesn't produce uh, that much. It's important to keep your colonies off the ground because you'll we have a lot of ants here. So you'll have to protect them against ants. And the way you protect your colonies against ants is to put sticky stuff. I guess you can buy it at home hardware. It's a uh, tangle foot, it's called. You can put it on trees to keep insects from climbing your tree, but you just stick that on the legs here and it keeps, uh, it solves the ant issue. Uh, and the other one is because cold air drops, it's just another way of uh, keeping your colony from uh, being exposed to uh, cold drafts and, uh, and weather. So when you're setting up your yard, uh, I'll talk about moving colonies. Just try to think, most of us aren't migratory. So I do move a couple colonies, maybe two or three colonies every year to different locations. But my, my hives tend to stay in the same location the whole season. And when I build my yards, I build them with a mind of I'll overwinter that colony in that location. Okay, so a pallet fence works great in the winter because it, it'll uh, help build nice big snow drifts and it protects that colony from uh, cold winds. Uh, if you do, for example, over here, so just the wire electric fence works fine in the bottom here, uh, but I found that with a solid barrier and then the bare fence, uh, it, it'll slow the bear down. 
So the bear, so this one's been zapped a couple bears, a couple black bears, and I think it's done a grizzly. Uh, as the bear approaches, it slows down because there's a solid barrier and then it'll get a nice zap. Uh, where here, if the bear knows what's there, it may just understand that uh, short-term pain for long-term gain. So uh, there's a higher risk that the bear will just charge through this fence especially if you've got other attractants around. Uh, think convenience. So for example, you can see my truck here. So I could drive my truck to my yards. Uh, so if you're gonna have to move your colonies, make sure you can get a vehicle nearby or, uh, or that there's a, a way of getting a trolley or, or something to help you move your colonies because they do get quite heavy. Uh, tripping hazards. So a friend beekeeper up uh, north was moving some of these boxes. He tripped on something, he got caught, and basically he had his ex exposed belly, and then he got a bunch of stings on his gut and belly. It wasn't an enjoyable experience. So keep your, your ground clear. I know I'm talking safety there, but uh, it'll save you some heartaches. Uh, this, this is about 18 inches off the ground, 20 inches, a little bit too high. So I've, my new standard now is about 10 inches off the ground. So it makes it working on the lower box, not too bad. Uh, but, uh, too high is, for example, this colony here had two honey supers. So I needed a little step ladder to get to the top of it and work the top because it was too tall. And when the box is 75 pounds, the top box, it's, it's kind of hard to get it down. So think ergonomics and back issues. So if it's too low, you're going to have a backache. If it's too high, then you might uh, hurt other muscles. So find that, that nice, uh, nice level. Because the more ergonomic, convenient, and accessible that your yards are, the more you'll inspect or the more you'll want and not neglect uh, key inspections when you have to. If there's no fours around where your yard is, then ask yourself why you're keeping bees there. Okay. And then the other one is about a water. So if there's no water source around, make sure you, you do something simple. Here's an old olive barrel with an old chicken water bottom. And these are just rocks, so the bees don't drown. And I just put it on the ground here, and the bees had, uh, they would empty that out about a week and a half. So uh, when it's hot, uh, they'll consume quite a bit of water. So any questions there? Sounds good. So relocating your hive, uh, again, if, the more you think about will my hive be in a location for most of its life, then this becomes less of a problem. Okay, so in future talks, we'll talk about splits and uh, like artificial swarms and stuff like that, where you, instead of letting the colony swarm, what you'll do is you'll take the old queen with a few frames of brood and honey, and then you're gonna move that to another location. So that's easy, uh, but you need to do it within a certain distance, okay? So for example, if you move a colony more than three miles, five kilometers, the bees will just redo their orientation flight and then basically they're fine, you can do things. Uh, but if you move a colony more than three feet, say 10 feet or 20 feet or 50 feet, uh, then it's a whole different story. So I remember the first time I moved a colony, I moved them about, uh, say about a hundred feet, so 30 meters. And lo and behold, the old location had all the foragers. So it had a few thousand bees just waiting for the, the hive to come back, but I'd moved them already. So, so what I had to do was put a dummy box there, get them hived at night, and then bring them back to the, uh, the new location and then block off the colony until the bees uh, could figure things out again. 
So moving colonies, if especially if you're new and you're not aware of it, is a headache. So make sure that you won't have to move your colonies. Be sure about the location where you're going to put your bees. Okay, because the more you move them, the more stress you're going to be causing them. Uh, we talked about bear protection. Uh, if your ground is dry, so sandy and not very uh, conductive, uh, most of us up here, we use a, it's called a ground return approach. So we have a alternating hot ground wire. And then basically this negative here, uh, let's see, the negative is just connected to our ground and to our grounding rod. Because uh, a lot of times you read the instructions, they tell you put these grounding rods all over the place or a metal type uh, carpet in front of your fence. But what does what happens here is if you keep the spacing, I don't know, maybe three inches, four inches, uh, the bear will touch both wires at the same time and then they get 100% zap of your fence. So for example, I've got uh, two systems. One gives them a 14,000 kV, uh, or sorry, 14,000 uh, volt uh, zap, and the other one's 11,000. And I can tell you it hurts, and uh, it works. So if you're in town, just a couple of ground, just make sure people can't see your colonies. Uh, not that people will, will steal them, but they may, or they'll basically, if they see it, they may complain. So I tend to ask people, just make sure people don't know, make sure your neighbors know, but uh, keep it out of sight. Uh, this applies to urban or rural. If, you, if your bees are in a location where they're flying towards your house or towards where your kids play or something like that, uh, you can put a solid fence, uh, say uh, 10 feet or so in front of your colony. And what happens is the bees will fly over the fence and then beeline straight over people's heads. So they won't hit people in the head. Uh, so for example, with my pallet fence, so the bees, basically, they'll, they'll do a launch this way and then go flat this way. So they'll tend to be above people's heads by the time they start flying the horizontal. So it's just a way of uh, avoiding issues with, uh, with people. So if there's sidewalks or anywhere where people walk, so again, just put something in their path to force the bees to, to fly up higher. Uh, if your friends or your neighbors have pools, just make sure you, you provide a water source nearby so that the bees will go to your water source and not visit the uh, neighbor's pool. And then usually, usually last year we had a lot of swarming even for first year people, but I'd say swarming defensive behavior. So you need to be able to understand how to spot swarming or pre-swarming and deal with it. And then defensive behavior is where you requeen. So if your bees are aggressive and they attack people and they follow you all the way to the house and your house is 30 meters or a hundred yards away, then chances are that your bees are, are very defensive and you might have to find a new queen. Uh, and then on swarming, this is where I recommend I guess second year beekeepers start learning about splits and equalizing their colonies just to, to reduce the uh, swarming pressure on those colonies. So there's a lot of videos on how to install packages and nooks. So I'm not really gonna cover it, uh, but really all you do is if you can't install your nook right away, a lot of times up here we use wooden boxes and I'll just put the wooden box where the colony is going to go and I would pop the, uh, the cork on the entrance and let the nook be their, their, their hive for a couple of days until I have time to install it. And then what I would do is I would move the nook over and then put the new hive box in the old location where the nook is 
I take the four middle frames out and then I would just in the same order, put the frames back in the box. Okay, and then now I used to shake all the bees out. I just tilt this over, lean it over and the bees will just make their way into this box. And then I put my feeder. A lot of times when we're feeding our colonies here, it's still cold. So then I'll put a, another box around my feeder and the top cover. So that way it's insulated and it keeps the sugar syrup warmer uh, and it won't get chilled. Okay, so I'll, I'll just use another deep box around the feeder. And again, the first time you do it, you might be nervous, but just take your time, don't rush it, be gentle, don't worry about the queen. If she's, if the queen is not in a cage on top of the bars here, just, just, just be very careful and just put the frames in the same order and put them down and, and then walk away. That's all you can do. Uh, and if you do spot the queen on a frame and you put her in, uh, and then that's where uh, once she's in there, then you're you're good. And uh, we'll we'll cover the sharp shake stop movement to to shake your first bees. The first time you have a frame full of bees and you want to knock the bees off, you'll be very careful, but. Uh, the sooner you learn to just give it a good shake stop uh, and the bees just come off way better and they're less annoyed with you than if you're trying to be gentle. So just a few last things. Uh, hive inspections. I'm just going to cover a few little things to show you how uh, how much time it actually takes to do things. So this here is, for example, inspections, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine inspections that I typically do. Uh, the first one here might be 10 to 20 minutes, uh, 10 to 20 minutes. And most of the ones in the middle here are about five minutes for myself, okay? Uh, and this is for a, a overwintered colony. And this is pretty much the timing I use here for, for my activities. So a lot of times you read about taking notes. There's so many inspection sheets out there. They're good to teach you what you need to do, uh, but it's a lot of note keeping. I do keep notes, uh, but Queen right, so I saw the queen, I saw eggs, I saw brood, I saw cat brood uh, and larvae. I saw some honey frames, uh, how many frames of bees? Does it smell weird? Were they aggressive and did they look healthy? So that's what I'm looking for, okay? So when I say food, so there's honey and then if there's pollen frames and stuff. It's always neat seeing the queen, but uh, it's not, uh, it's not my purpose when I'm uh, doing most of my inspections. So if, if I'm gonna put a queen excluder in, then I need to find the queen. Or if I'm gonna do a split, then I need to find the queen. So again, if you have no reason to go in there, don't go in there. Okay, so I'll show you how I, for example, I inspected my colonies a couple of days ago without actually opening up the colony. Okay, so here it's quite a long time. So usually for beginners, I say five to seven days. Uh, if I'm in swarm and my colonies are really populous and close to swarming, or I feel like they're swarm, then I might do five to seven days. Uh, but if it's non-swarming times, then 10 to 14 days is plenty. So I did, uh, Let's see, I got one of my singles ready for spring. So I did a cleanup. So I pulled two frames. I found some brood and some eggs. So I put it back down, closed it up. Uh, I just took the box off, cleaned off the bottom board. I scraped all the dead bees into a, a garbage can. 
I put a pollen patty on top of the frames. I put my, 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 my spacer top cover. I put a feeder on top. I filled the feeder, put my top cover, put the rock. So my spring inspection actually took me about five minutes for a overwintered colony that I hadn't seen in 200 in 30 days. So the last time I opened that colony was back in September. So when I saw eggs, I'm like, good. So there's a queen. I saw cat brood. I saw some fuzzy bees. So it tells me that in the last, the, the first brood cycle started more than 21 days ago. So, and the box was just jam packed with bees. So I was like, yes. So I'll have to add a, an extra super uh, probably in the next week. So the reason they brooded up so early is I added a pollen patty about uh, on April 3rd. And we'll cover why I do that and how it, it gives me an extra month of, it gives me an extra brood cycle. And that's what I'm looking for in our short season. Uh, so general bee health, uh, it's all stuff I said already. And I'll, I'll show you the screen bottom board. Okay, so this here. So I did my spring cleanup on Sunday. And then on Monday, is it Monday? Monday or Tuesday, Monday. I, uh, in the evening, I walked over to the hives. I pulled the tray out. So th this is from before, but uh, I think one colony had four or five mites. The other one had one. Uh, there was some different debris. So some white wax, uh, some brown cappings, some dead body parts. So it tells me what the bees are doing. So, and then I checked the feeder to see if any bees had gone up into the feeder. Uh, a few of them had bees. I touched the syrup, it was kind of cold. So I added some, uh, so two, I have lots of insulation. So I added uh, two inches of insulation on top of the feeder to help keep it warmer and keep the top of the colony and that, that brood nest warmer. So even now. So just by pulling your bottom boards, it'll tell you a lot about what's going on in colony. For example, this is another example. Uh, this one had, you may not know what this is. It's a type of disease. So these are, it's, uh, it's chalk brood, it's called. It's a fungal disease, I believe. And it affects the brood. And usually when the bees are under stress, a stressor of some type, uh, or there's, uh, and they can't handle the infection. So then they basically, they mummify some of the brood and it becomes like hard, hard, hard. And basically they uncap, they pull out these mummies, throw them out. You'll see them on your landing board sometimes or on your debris board. And if it's really, really bad, uh, it means that more bees are dying or being disposed of that are being born and eventually it could be really bad. So they, if you find frames that are really infested with uh, chalk root, it's better to just chuck that frame out and throw it in the garbage because uh, there's a fungal infection on it. So no point uh, worrying about it. Sometimes you might have to requeen because the queen is just not able to is not hygienic enough, their, their genetics. So requeening, so here are some examples of cages. Uh, and when you're first starting, you may, because a few people are fairly advanced and they want to make their own queens. So if you make your own queens, here's just the chart of, for example, if you raise queen from a brood, it's 49 days until that first new bee would emerge, at least that, okay? So if you start today, it'll be almost a month before you see your first bee, if everything works the way you want, okay? The challenge up here is uh, if you do it in May, we tend to get a chill early June. Uh, so, it's really, really difficult. So that's why I tend to use queen cells or swarm cells, really mature swarm cells uh, that they've naturally produced, or I just buy a queen. 
and it's easier to, to requeen with a, a live queen. So we'll do a whole talk on queens, but uh, I guess for now we'll just cover it. It's something you need to know about and it actually doesn't take very long to, to requeen. It's a couple visits. It's more waiting patiently before releasing the queen is key. Uh, a lot of people want to buy ex extractors and stuff like that. I'd say if you haven't, if you're in your first year, maybe second year, uh, you may want to hold off. Up here, we've got our club uh, extractor. It's at the behind the barn, so you can borrow that. Uh, and it's cheaper. So I bought myself one last year after about eight years. And the reason I bought it is... Uh, this one here was too small and it's the one I have now is just better and quicker. But when you're first starting out, uh, it's probably not worth buying an extractor until you consistently start making honey. Uh, Time-wise, so for example, here you've got to pull your honey. Uh, you've got to store it because you probably won't have time to process it right away. Uh, I use my guest cabin now and I make a fire in there and I get it nice and toasty warm to soften up the, the wax and the honey uh, before extraction. Uh, and it usually takes me a night. So a couple hours, say three hours to extract uh, probably a hundred pounds of honey. Uh, and I might do that once or twice, depending on volume, but uh, that's another time commitment once you start getting honey. When you're insulating, once you have your kit, so this is Doug Phillips' kit, uh, and he just keeps these in his CCAM and he doesn't have to remake it every year. He just reuses his uh, insulation. And this fellow here is six years now, five or six years, and he hasn't lost a colony yet. So he's had four this year, five last year, uh, three, four, and basically it's been five years and he hasn't lost a colony yet. So uh, he's doing something right. So he does manage his mites. He feeds when he has to. Uh, and he inspects to make sure it requeens if he has to. So he doesn't, uh, he's very proactive. So we'll cover this, but for him to set up his colony to, for winter takes him about 20 minutes because basically he pops the shell on top. He puts a piece of styrofoam underneath, pops the shell on top puts his insert in, puts his burlap bag, uh, and then puts a piece of styrofoam. And then he's got his insulated top cover that he just sticks on there. Uh, he's actually modified this now that he'll keep insulation on year round because he found he got better honey harvests up here by keeping his insulation on his colony year round. Uh, and it's easy to take off, it just slides right off. So it doesn't really take or make his inspection any longer. Uh, it's just, uh, he's got a, I think a shorter version, a too deep version insulation shell. And the other thing is when you do lose hives in the spring, uh, you're gonna take time to have a look at them. So you're gonna try to figure out what to kill that colony. Uh, so when you're going through, it's really important for you to to try to understand and collect as much information as you can. So a lot of pictures. So for example, here, this colony here was a double. This box here was just jammed full of bees, but within a month it was dead. I knew it had nosema. I was hoping the nosema would work its way through the system, but uh, I guess they, they just couldn't recover. I put some pollen patties some sugar, cake because it was still too cold to, to feed, but the queen and the bees were just lethargic and not able to, to brood, brood up very good. Okay, so most of the causes of failure is beekeeper. Okay, even poor winter prep, let's see, we tend to use like weather as an excuse. So if you know you have bad weather, then you've got to insulate, you've got to do something to prevent those bees from dying. Okay, so the more you 
own up to why your colonies died, the easier it'll be to figure out a better way of keeping your bees. Okay. Or just live with the loss. Say it happens. Uh, I'll lose 20%. I'll lose half my hives every year. Just live with it if that's what you want. But if you want to do better, then you need to tweak things. Every year I tweak something to, and try different things because I'm, I want to get to, uh, to perfection, but uh, it's hard. And so again, so this was from a dead out and I just cleaned up my frames. I sprayed uh, peroxide on them, put them out in the sun for a while just to, uh, to give them a nice uh, cleanse, UV cleanse. But uh, in early spring, so again, I take a lot of pictures, but anyways, it takes you uh, probably 10 to 30 minutes to do a spring inspection to get things organized. And uh, these were my clusters last year coming out of winter. And yeah, all these colonies did really well and a few of them did too well. And uh, I had trouble controlling swarms in them. So we'll stop there. Uh, so moving on from here, things are gonna get a bit more in depth. So we're gonna cover biology and probably the environments and like forage. But uh, I'd say this is where it gets a bit more uh, in depth and biology is critical. And it's, uh, it's, it's what you need to learn. The more biology and you understand why bees do what they do and what drives them, the easier things will be. Okay, so in a northern or a very cold climate, uh, bees have to stay warm. So if you know that, then that's why you'll say, I'll put them in a, a sunny location. So when I first started, all my advice came from down south. So my yard was partially sunny. So it was sunny in the morning, and then it had shade in the afternoon. But then I quickly found out that shade in the afternoon drops the temperature by five, five degrees Celsius. So I was like, ooh, this is stupid. So then I moved those colonies to a new location. And then I learned about the behavior that bees go back to the old spot. Uh, my intention was good, move my colonies to a sunny spot. But then I understood that, well, they have to reorient. I can't just move bees in the middle of the day because all the bees went back to the old location. So then another lesson learned. So I'd say it's a learning process and you try to learn from other people. So we'll open it up to questions if you have any. And uh, yeah, we'll go from there. Anybody going to break the ice? Hey, Tim, I've got a question for you. Can you hear me? Yep, it's all good. Uh, my first question was going to be, being in the north, I'm in, I'm in Whitehorse and never had bees and got a wood, wood beehive, um, was to what color to paint my hive. But now I'm more concerned on how to make this permanent insulation uh, that you mentioned that person keeps on his hive all year round. Um, is, is there like a, is there anything I can look up for how to do that and where to put the holes in that or, or just, just so you know, Doug, he just experimented last year. So I'd say your first year is more about building wax. Uh, well, Owen, set up some permanent insulation on some of his colonies for his uh, his research paper. But uh, yeah, just reach out to me and I'll get you some stuff. But I'd say don't worry too much about it for year one. You'll have to insulate for the winter. Uh, and just if you, how many colonies are coming in? One or two? Just one, just trying one. Yeah. So I'd say pick a dark color, like a dark green or 
and just a darker color is better because it'll capture more of the sun. Uh, if you protect your colony against the wind, then you'll reduce the wind chill. So the cold air blowing by and sucking the heat out of that colony. So I'd say all of that is more important. Doug's doing it to, to get more honey. Uh, and I'll, I'll, sh I'll probably call cover something called follow boards. So you can probably do a follow board first. And it's an insulated frame that you would put on the inside of the box. And it helps reduce the volume and also insulate as your, your colony expands, you, you can pull them out. So I'd say that's probably the easiest thing for you to worry about year one is learn how to use follow boards, insulated follow boards. Okay. Um, but you, you also mentioned that people on hot days have it insulated at the top because it gets too hot or yeah. is that also something? You, again, that's finessing. So you'll need to do it for winter. So you're, if you've got a one inch piece of styrofoam, like for example, uh, we'll get close to anywhere from zero to 10 Celsius, even in summer nights up here. So having uh, the, let's see, a one inch piece of styrofoam inside your inner cover or inside your top cover helps just prevent the heat loss from the top. So most of your heat loss is through the top. So if you put a one inch piece of styrofoam inside your, your inner cover, not your inner cover, sorry, your, your top cover, your telescoping lid, then uh, yeah. like, uh, let's see, Doug had it. Oops, I'll have to. Yeah, no, I can't reshare there, but uh, Doug had it uh, inside his winter setup. So it's just, you'll have your top cover. You put a piece of styrofoam in inside. Okay, awesome, thanks. Yep. Anybody else? Marcel, just uh, for your top, sorry, your top bar colony that you're getting, uh, are you getting a package of bees or nooks? Um, I order uh, nooks, uh, so yeah, I don't know. Okay, so I'll, uh, I'll talk to you later because uh, we'll see what kind of bees you have because we'll, you'll have to figure out how to introduce your bees to your top bar hive. There's a couple of tricks yeah. and I can uh, show Jill how to, to set it up. Okay, thank you. No problem. Anybody else? So I guess if everybody's good, uh, hopefully it was helpful. And uh, if you do have any specific questions, just email me the questions and it helps. And I guess there's a question on the flow hive. Uh, I guess if you listen to podcasts, uh, Beekeeping Today podcasts, the episode from Monday this week was on the flow hive. Uh, in cold places, I'd say uh, learn to beekeep first. And then if you can get honey consistently, then I'd say you could try it, uh, but they are expensive. So, one super is the price of a, a colony. So I'd say it's, it's if you want to try it, I'd say try it in year two. But, uh, and understand your, your nectar flows before you invest in a, a flow hive. One more question for you, Tan. Sure. Um, Getting my bees for the first time end of May, um, and you, you touched on it briefly. If 
if you were me, what would you do with um, your high producer at the bottom? Like what stage would you put it at and how long would you, until you first switch it to be in bigger size or? Yeah, chances are you'll have it on the smallest size. It'll be about an inch and it'll probably be most of the season you'll have it that small. Uh, especially because you'll notice because if it's a four frame nook that you're getting, there'll be four frames of bees and then some empties. And if you use those follow boards, you'll have say maybe six frames, six or eight frames and then the follow board. And as your colony expands, uh, because there's no wax, so they have to make the wax. So it's a slow process. So make sure you have a feeder of some type uh, and then once you get through that first box, the full box is fully drawn out. You'll add a second box and it's something we can cover next one, but, uh, chances are you, you might move some frames of brood to the top box in the middle and then put some empties and then you'll squish your brood nest in the bottom. So it sounds complicated, but once you understand biology of the nest and how the brood works, it starts making sense, but uh, chances are you'll likely keep it to the smallest or to the medium size most of the, the first season. Like I said, I keep mine at two inches the whole year. And okay. uh, it, it really makes no difference. I have a question. All right, right on. Sure. Bernie? Just, just following up on Madison's thing, talking about the reducer, does that reducer, when you make it small like that, because the hive is so small, small, does that um, help the bees as far as their defense of the hive is concerned? That's the main purpose. Because the early season wasps are not really an issue. Uh, if you're in an area and there's other beekeepers in the area and they have strong colonies uh, and you're feeding your bees, and you've got a really wide open entrance, so it might promote uh, robbing. Uh, by keeping a small entrance, you'll just prevent any robbing. You'll help protect them against wasps or hornets and, uh, and other insects. So I just, uh, and on a really busy day, you might get a lot of bees moving in and out, but uh, yeah, I'd say two inches should be fine, two to three inches max when your colony gets to a, at least a full single box of bees. Thank you. Sound good. So we'll leave it there. And so yeah, next one's bee biology. And then I'll cover a bit of winter biology, but uh, I'd say what you do now, for example, I did my spring inspection. I found one colony with 24 hours, so five mites in 24 hour natural drop. So I'm gonna run a single OAV. So ox like a, a oxalic acid vapor, uh, treatment just to see what the drop is because uh, my my counts are fairly low usually but if I do a treatment I'll get all these mite drops and then if I get anything more than 25 I'll treat again uh, and that's just the uh, and that's how I'm going to deal with the mites if I don't have mites I don't have to worry about uh, winter losses very much so we'll cover mites and pests uh, at a later point. Sounds good. Thank you, ATN. No worries. So have a great night and talk to you guys soon.